So this is going to be a talk about uh, riding the upstream wave of Zephyr and uh, you know, developing an out-of-tree application and how to keep it in sync with upstream. So I just want to do a quick introduction. Um, so Lenaro is the company that we all work for. Um, it's a collaborative engineering uh, organization that's kind of focusing on, on ARM solutions. Um, the group that the presenters are working in is Lenaro Technologies. Uh, they're a small team inside Lenaro. We focus on like open source, taking open source software, making it better, and then you know, applying it to a real world solution. So that's kind of what we're, we're all about. Um, so I'm Tyler Baker. This is Ricardo and Michael. They're going to be presenting kind of a co-presentation today because we've all got kind of different parts and different perspectives. So if you're interested afterwards in getting in touch with us about anything, we've got links here. This, these slides have been uploaded so you can grab them off the web um, and, and follow us or send us messages. So what are we building with Zephyr? Um, it's pretty simple. So we're building an application that delivers firmware over the air um, to real hardware and multiple MCUs when we talk about hardware. Uh, so we want to use the latest from the Zephyr project, and it's been um, successful, but it's also been difficult, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So what hardware did we work on? So these three platforms are the ones um, that we've mainly been focused on. They're all ARM CPUs because that's what kind of Lenaro focuses on. Um, so two of them are 96 boards, uh, which is part of our 96 board program. The other one's an NXP chip. Um, all of these are supported to some extent upstream in Zephyr. Um, so we had a hand in some of that, and uh, the K64F was, was pretty well supported when we started. So how does this firmware over the air app work? So really, what we're going to talk about is this part of the equation, but there's a lot more pieces than just the Zephyr part. So we're talking Zephyr, our Zephyr application talks six low pan to the gateway. Our gateway joins devices with a service that we wrote, so it can you know, search out beacons or search out MAC addresses and add them, and then we can start to communicate over uh, IPv6 at the gateway, which then turns it uh, from IPv6 to IPv4 to talk with web services. Uh, as we were going along with this demo, we've been working on this for about six months now, uh, we realized none of the cloud services natively support IPv IPv6. So the IoT devices, endpoints, can't talk directly to these services. So we have to kind of do a little bit of uh, six to four tunneling um, to get things to work. So that's kind of the architecture of, of what we built. Um, and we're really just going to focus on the far left piece today. But if you have any questions during this presentation, and we have a small enough group, just go ahead and stop me and throw your hand up, and we can talk about yeah. Is this solution that we uh, talk about, is this open source or is this closed? So the question is, is this implementation that we're going to talk about open or closed source? It's all open at the, at the moment. Yeah, and I, I intend it to be that way um, for the foreseeable future. So let's get started. OK, so let's talk about what our project goals are here. So we want to support delivering firmware over the air. What does that mean? Well, we have to have an AV partitioning scheme. There's been lots of presentations at uh, ELC this year about AV partitioning. So it's really not much different than that, but just doing it with Zephyr. So we basically download firmware to a scratch partition, and then we have a bootloader that will go back, crypto cryptographically validate the images. And if they succeed, we'll boot into them. If they don't, it rolls back. So we have all that working. Um, hardware, we wanted to support all the, the MCUs that we listed before. Um, technical debt. Zephyr's moving very quickly. We want to keep our patch set low and rebase on upstream master as much as we can. So that means upstreaming all our platform code and keeping you know application changes in sync with upstream, which you know sounds easy easy to write on a slide, very difficult to do in practice. Um, and then quality. We want a testable design when we're building this because we want this end-to-end -end solution to continue to work, and it's you know something that we can use to help you know fix any issues that we may find in Zephyr, so that you know we have something that's open source that works, and it's a real-world use case that we can kind of test with. Um, so we want to al also automate all the things. We want to do leverage as much automation as possible to you know keep the the work, the manual labor of of keeping everything in sync, uh, kind of you know make make that easier. So I'm going to have Ricardo come up and talk about, you know, things that were missing when we started. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so just going to talk like quickly a little bit of the, the challenges and the work that we did when we started this. Um, Tyler d showed like the, the three boards that we wanted to support at the time, but um, we were kind of designing the boards as well, especially the 96 boards ones, uh, kind of in parallel when we're trying to decide what we're going to do on the software side and uh, the project itself. 
So uh, we, the first thing that you know, like that we had in our mind is is to try to get it supported by Zephyr, right? We were charting Zephyr, so we had like to get back and see, you know, like the MCUs were supported or not, and get that in place, and see uh, kind of everything else that was missing in there, so that we can actually, you know, like try to focus a little bit more on the application side. So some of the things that we found out is uh, the usual like lack of hardware because the project was quite new and recent at that time. At least like in particular with ARM, there was like not seven, you know like not many MCUs supported by the project. So we we had like especially on the carbon here, uh, we were using two different MCUs. One uh, just main, the main uh, application uh, based uh, MCU like the STM32, and then the one uh, M, uh, NR51 uh, just simply providing the Bluetooth part of it because the, the, the main uh, MCU doesn't provide Bluetooth by default. So we kind of had to think, you know, like how we're going to get that supported and how we're going to get that to work uh, with Zephyr at that time. So there were sev several complications. Uh, we, we had like to contribute a lot as well, like in, uh, um, especially kind of in the early days to get all of this going. And, you know, like there's no, for example, there's, there was no um, specific like bootloader supporting Zephyr at the time, besides, you know, like simply the ROM that was available in some of the hardwares. And uh, as, uh, as Tyler like showed up, like we wanted a bootloader that could validate the images, swap the images and so on, and also be generic across uh, multiple hardware. Uh, so we didn't have anything in Zephyr at the time. We were looking around and other like our tosses. We, we, we did find like a project that had that already kind of in place, which what uh, the runtime guys like uh, talking about like yesterday, uh, we now kind of have sorted that out as a common bootloader. And um, also uh, some of the things that we found at that time, like even though like for example Nitrogen, uh, which was uh, an RF52 based at MCU, was supported already in Zephyr, there were several things lacking and missing. Like for example, uh, the flash driver wasn't in place, even GPIO wasn't kind of well supported, so we had like to do several fixes across uh, and the boards that we wanted to use, and, and besides just simply including uh, uh, hardware support in that case. So, and then after, I think like two or three months, we were working and, and trying to get to, kind of was our first milestone, like in Connect la last year, like in September, try to demonstrate, you know, like go through like those project goals and try to show up something, uh, you know, like showing the, the update over the air, basically with those boards that we wanted. So we simply focused on, uh, uh, on carbon and nitrogen at that time, simply because we were you know, like also demonstrating the gateway and having the conversation over Bluetooth 6 low pan. And, uh, and what we were able to demo in there was, uh, at that time, was based on uh, Zephyr 1.5, like I think 1.6 was released a few, uh, not that you know, like far from that date that we had uh, the demo. We were able to demonstrate um, the entire Bluetooth support over uh, uh, six low pan and uh, and getting uh, the device you know, talking through the gateway to uh, uh, an open source uh, cloud based service, uh, not service but like the uh, the server uh, based uh, on Hawkbit, using one of the the nine six boards uh, community edition boards as gateway. In that case, we're using Dragon Board. We're using High Key now, um, and uh, we we. At that time, because of the bootloader problem that we had, we simply decided there was like no time to get that properly done in, in Zephyr. So, the demo that we had, we were simply using the bootloader from different RTOS that was actually booting Zephyr. So it was one of the things that we wanted to fix moving forward. But and uh, one of the other things that was nice as well is that by the time we were looking at uh, in Carbo in particular, because of the the difference here that you have a different S uh, MCU providing Bluetooth support. The only firmware that was available at the time for this MCU was like a proprietary firmware, uh, which is called Soft Device, which is also like containing a proprietary protocol. So we wanted to avoid, you know, like having to add a proprietary protocol in Zephyr and see, you know, like if you could have something that's more generic, like a pure uh, HCI protocol, for example. And one of the nice things uh, is that by the time we were looking at that problem, like uh, I think this slide went off. All right, there you go. Uh, is that Nordic uh, showed up and contributed the whole like controller uh, stack, which was great for us. We just had to get that to work uh, with uh, the NR51. And then one of the challenges, of course, like in there, is that there was no Cortex M0 support at the time, and that is Cortex M0. So we had to first work with Zephyr to get the M0 support in place, get support for all of those MCUs, get support for the boards, 
and then we could actually get the carbon to be online and, and you know like use the Bluetooth connectivity and so on. And um, by the time that we that we had that demo, we had still like several technical dabs and several things that we wanted to fix. The first thing is of course like we didn't want to use like two R toss to demonstrate our project. We simply wanted to focus on on, on Zephyr. So the first thing is is sorting out the bootloader, right? How can we get like a bootloader Zephyr compatible? Booting another Zephyr application. Uh, the other things that we that we had in mind as well is that uh, the project is moving like really fast, and especially like over the last uh, couple of months. Like a lot more contributors are joining up the project and so on. And uh, we wanted to at that point, you know, like continue working on the, on the application and the demo, but making sure that everything that we're doing we're in sync with upstream and continue, you know, like contributing and testing and, and make sure that we simply didn't like fork the project at that time. And uh, we still had like several changes that uh, we're carrying in our branch, uh, in particular here, as I'm saying, uh, the spy uh, support, uh, the um, slave support as well. So uh, there's like some discussion that we had like uh, on this um, um, over the, the past few days, and we hope like to get this sorted soon to get this merged upstream as well. There you go. The slide went off again. All right. So, and also like we we wanted to be prepared with the core changes that were you know like going to happen with Zephyr uh, 1.6 and 1.7. One of the things that we were kind of scared about at that time is like the IP stack. We were planning on replacing the entire IP stack, and at the point that we had this demo, we kind of had it working with the old stack. So there's several things you know like that are going to be replaced uh, over you know like the following releases. So we wanted to try to make sure you know like to be aligned in getting that out to work as we, you know, like continue working on the project. So um, I'll hand it over now to my, uh, Michael who's going to talk a little bit of the challenges of, you know, like of keeping in sync with upstream and kind of the issues that we had after the presentation and since uh, until we actually are now. Yeah, it's going to talk a little bit about the fun that we had with it. It's, it's better now. Good morning. Yeah, it was, uh, so obviously, you know, at the end of Connect, we were in a fairly good place. The demo was mostly working. It had its complexity, and we knew what we wanted to solve. But then, but then we had upgrades we had to deal with. Um, and I think the, the, there, was a, there was an initial sort of, hey, we got to get everything working. Zephyr's just go, go, go. Let's get the code in. Let's move faster. And then with the change to 1.6, Zephyr kind of started establishing itself, and we kind of started feeling like, wow, we we're really going places. Everybody kind of started joining in, thinking that maybe it was a little more stable than it was, but it's still moving super fast. And so I think we're kind of entering the gold rush phase of Zephyr right now, where everybody's kind of like, let's get aboard, let's go. And here's where we had problems. So obviously the biggest change that, that we introduced, in, or at least Zephyr introduced in 1.6, was we unified the kernels but prior to 1.6. We had the uh, two different models. You had the nano model and you had the uh, microkernel model. And uh, we obviously had code that was out of tree. We were using fibers and we were using all of the, uh, the previous APIs. So immediately we had to start adjusting our code, which wasn't in the source trees. So you know, we, it took quite a while to bring that back up. Um, and then came the IP stack. So what could possibly go wrong? It's a new IP stack. You know, we kind of have an IP-based app. Uh, when we jumped in, I think we had a higher expectation of where the stack was going to be at. And, and I don't know whether we jumped in maybe just ahead of sort of the maintainers and where they were at. I'm sure they had use cases that they were testing. But to be honest, when we jumped in, it just wasn't working. I mean, it wouldn't connect. The, the states were wrong. Um, there was quite a bit of debugging that went into this. I mean, I think we spent three to four weeks of literally looking at TCP dumps, figuring out why things weren't connecting, adding our own tooling to figure out where the debugging was going. Um, and so I think if, if it was one thing I'm pretty proud of is that we made some really good contributions to the IP stack. And I think as open source citizens, that's kind of the responsibility. If you're going to try to develop an app, you're going to stay upstream, you know, we can all make really good contributions and get things working together. So now everybody benefits, right? And at the end of this, um, I think we're on a Zephyr 1.7 now. It, it is working. And it TCP is, is functional. And, uh, and it's actually in pretty good shape. It's a lot better than it was. Question, 
1.6 was completely broken when we went when we jumped to it. Now 1.5 was, you mean 1. 1.5 was working okay. Uh, it definitely had issues, and I can see why we wanted to migrate away from that and get to a more stable stack where we had a little more control. This was definitely built from the ground up. I mean, the the code was there. They had done a good job of kind of getting the the base. Um, sort of structures in place. I just think that, like I said, we kind of jumped in a little early. They were testing UDP at the time, and I think we were kind of early into the TCP phase. Um, and, but it but worked out, and to be honest, the maintainers were great. As we were submitting patches, they were very responsive. Just to add to that, I mean, all of that had been in the development Yeah, yeah. This code was not released yet. No, and that's a good point. It was fixed, like, in the web, actually was supposed to be. We were literally daily or every other day rebasing on master to try to bring in changes and make sure that everything was going to work. It was, it was kind of an incredible, you know, it was a big switch for us. I know, obviously, um, this, was, this was our biggest challenge, really, to get, and it was timing. Some of it was timing. You know, we happened to have a purely TCP-based app that needed some sort of core functionality. It just wasn't ready yet. But, but I think it worked out really well. And I'm going to talk about problems, but I do want to focus on, you know, this is sort of our, our commitment that when you, when you pick up an RTOS or you pick up something that does have problems, it, you, and you fix them, you need to get them upstream. We need to get things fixed so that everybody benefits. And, um, and that's, so I don't want to be totally negative about the problems. I think it all worked out towards the, towards the end. Um, some of the other issues is obviously, you know, the documentation is changing. Things are, things are changing so fast in the system. Sometimes you don't necessarily, it's not clear, like if you're going to implement like a flash driver, if the erase needs the right protection set or things like that. And these things cause little delays along the, along the way. So, you know, as we moved along, we sort of just little by little, you know, the whole project sort of kind of got rebuilt on Zephyr 1.6 and 1.7. And then we thought we had everything working. Yay, the IP stack's sort of working. And then there's a ton of knobs. I mean, there are so many settings in Zephyr to control the memory usage for the stack and for the, um, you have data buffers and you have transmit buffers and receive buffers. You've got Bluetooth buffers. I mean, it's, it's an end to end. I would say, I really felt like the knobs doubled uh, between Zephyr 1.5 and maybe 1.6. And so we spent quite a time uh, debugging what were the right settings for our app, you know, versus the defaults. A lot of the defaults are still old settings versus new settings. And luckily, these are getting better. These are things where, as we bring up issues and use cases, you can make real changes so that maybe the next guy doesn't have to configure his app from scratch. If you have a TCP app, the defaults are better for, you know, where the, the TX and the RX buffers are and things like that. But these definitely cause problems. I mean, there was just... Um, kind of one thing after the other. And a lot of these issues, um, you know, being new to, it was, I jumped on board right after the switch. So I, there's a fundamental understanding of what you need to turn on to really debug your app. A lot of the errors don't print without turning on a config. Um, so it's not, it's not maybe natural thinking, but you, you have to enable the debugging. I mean, it's, uh, you would think maybe some of the errors would print automatically, but they really, they don't. And then some of, the, um, some of the debugging is so heavy, you can only turn it on for a little while because it actually causes race conditions and other things to kind of creep up in your code. So it's, debugging is kind of, a, it's kind of a lesson all by itself. And then we hit other issues. So obviously our, our app is uh, dependent on six low pan. Six low pan has been around a while for the, in the Linux kernel, but uh, I'm, it'll come back. <laughs> But, the, uh, but we actually were hitting Linux kernel problems as well. And so uh, it, there again, we have a couple patches we're looking at now. We have one already, I think, that's going to get submitted. But the interface is debugfs currently. And it's, it's almost like it's still a very work in progress type, uh, type protocol. So there actually, if you hammer that debugfs a little too quickly, you can cause the kernel to crash. And there are other issues where, you know, there was a uh, ref counting issue that got figured out. And these all kind of added to the complexity right around this time period of going from, you know, this what was seeming to work to our newer app, which is now a lot more stable. And so here we are today. We're, uh, we're based on Zephyr 1.7, RC1, although I believe maybe RC2 just came out. We have a unified bootloader, which is maintained outside of the Zephyr and the uh, Minute code base, but it works with both. And you have kind of a real good community of like con contribu you know, contributions there where it's, uh, it's validating images, we're using real technology, real security. Um, we've got an IP to work. Uh, there's still some probably fixes in place. I know that um, we actually still are dealing with like a six low pan issue where there's, you know, the headers are still getting modified and that, but that's coming. So once again, you know, 
we have more Zephyr changes coming, and I think the focus is that we need to focus on master and keep as close as possible to the upstream so that you can, you can still get the benefits of where Zephyr is going because it is moving so fast. So down at the bottom here, we still have a, this is kind of a summary of like what our diff versus master branch is, things we're gonna try to get upstream. We have a couple of the speed drivers. And I'm gonna hand it back off to Tyler. Tell you how we're doing it. Thanks, Michael. So now I'm going to talk about continuous integration and automation. So we just kind of saw where we started from and then you know where the current state of the demo is and the problems we hit along the way. So um, now I want to talk about how we're trying to keep this app functional and still rebasing on master. So first thing we got to do is we got to keep track of the sources. So all of our code is in GitHub. So funny enough, we just decided that we were going to integrate with GitHub because that's how our workflow works. So. Um, I hear that there's talk about having the Zephyr project moved to, 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 Gar or to GitHub uh, away from Garrett, so that seems to work well with our workflow, so we, we endorse it. Um, so the Zephyr tree itself, there's three branches we're monitoring. So upstream master, our master upstream dev branch, which is a mirror of master with patches on top, and then 1.7 dev, which is like our stable uh, type branch. Oh, that's fun. Is it the projector doing that? Yeah, okay, oops. Okay, so then we have MCU boot, two branches there. MCU boot's a Zephyr application, right? So we have to validate it against all the Zephyr trees up there. So the growing permutation list, right, that we have to validate against. And then our photo application also builds against the Zephyr tree. So now we have to build it against all these branches. So yeah, I mean, this is a complex matrix of just build testing this stuff. So we wanted to you know, integrate with the uh, GitHub and have our CI there because I don't want to force people to go to some other website to look at the results of, of some of the CI. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So if you go to our GitHub page for the photo app, you'll see this. This is updated live. These badges come right off of our CI server. Um, so like our 96 board carbon on Zephyr Master is failing to build. There's a uh, flash driver patch set that uh, is in progress that Kumar is going to graciously merge here very soon so we can fix our build issues. Uh, already, already merged. Good to hear. So I, yeah, this is a snapshot. This is an image. It's not live. <laughs> so yeah, this is just, you know, okay, this is how our app's building for our different platforms that we care about across our branches. So we can see when something breaks in master and this, our app is failing to build, we know about it instantly. And we get, you know, when that build fails, we get an email as developers. So that's really nice. But we can also kind of see, okay, there's, there's something upstream that's coming that we need to investigate. And either it's a regression or it's something's changed and we need to know about it up front so we can get patches together in our master upstream and figure out if we need to upstream or that's something we're going to have to hold. So let's look at the next one. So this app's got lots of dependencies. So that's on the first page. If you click the dependencies link, you'll see we have to track all of the MCU boot changes, right? So you've got two branches of MCU boot versus the three branches of Zephyr. And we've got this, this build matrix too. Uh, down here is actual sanity check across all three branches. So that's just checking Zephyr. And so we have this kind of at a glance for developers to look at since they're going to go to GitHub anyways and uh, look at pull requests. So that seemed to work out OK. So what's the strategies that we use? So we need to answer some questions. How do we stay close to upstream? You know, how do we reduce our technical debt, keep our patch set small? But how do we do all of this and make something that works? Because that's the challenge. It's always a challenge doing that. So. Basically, we have our solution is we're going to build and use automation as much as we can to kind of have, do the heavy lifting. So we build all the tests. We run the unit tests for applications on supported hardware. We run functional tests on our application. So we actually like, like flash it onto devices, check that it comes up, and then test the end-to-end -end story, which I'll show you in a second. Um, so how does this keep us sane? Well, this, it's changing all the time. So it's just better to detect problems because they're just going to be there so that you can deal with them and it's not a surprise. So we were actually looking to rebase on RC2 and we did some testing and there's a regression. So, you know, five out of, or five times out of six, you know, our devices update. And when it jumps to the next slot where the, the application loads, it's just hanging. So there's, there's an issue that's, that's popped up just between RC1 and RC2 that we need to look at now. But we were able to kind of identify that with some of the CI and, and automation practices. So what do we do for pre-merge testing? So we've got it all hooked up to, to GitHub. So if anybody does a pull request, they're going to get this little five checks. So what are the five checks? We build the photo application. So this is the tip of master plus the pull request. So all the patches applied. Then our bootloader, we just sanity check it, that we can still build it. It doesn't really 
probably don't even need to have the bootloader here, but we do it anyways. Then we run check pass, just like you guys do on upstream Zephyr projects in Garrett. Um, and then we actually deploy the devices. So we, these basically wait for these to finish, and we deploy a bootloader and the application that the pull request represents to a device and just check that it actually comes up. And we use the uh, test case utils library within Zephyr to create parsable output, and I'll talk about that in a second, but we can basically tell, you know, okay, Bluetooth came up, uh, we're advertising the right profile, you know, it's all ready to go, it's not necessarily hooked up to a gateway and talking, you know, IPv6, but the app comes up, the Bluetooth radio comes up, that's good enough for us to just say, yeah, that, that's probably okay. So this is what it looks like. It's a little verbose. You can turn this stuff off to comment, like stop commenting on the statuses and just use that little information box, which I think we'll probably switch to, because you'll get emails every time this happens. And I know that's a problem in Garrett, but at least we can turn that stuff off uh, with GitHub. So that's kind of how that looks. So how do we do the hardware testing? I used to be a, a maintainer for Lava, so we kind of naturally decided that, well, let's try to use it, right? So uh, I developed an upstream to bare metal testing interface. So it's like a monitoring testing interface. So it basically just grabs the console after or it flashes the device. And there's a way to basically detect uh, start and ends of test cases. You can parse the console output with a regular expression. And then there's also a new feature we added um, that allows you to send commands and then parse the output of that command. So like if you have a shell, like we have a shell application kind of built into our, our application so we can you know, poke different things and, and like do functional testing that way uh, rather than just relying on the app to do all of its own testing. Um, so we added some firmware tool support. So like PyOCD supported, DFU utils, the mass storage, I'm not really sure what to call that. It's basically where there's a mass storage device and you, you drag and drop an application. Well, we just mount it and copy the application over and then unmount. Um, so these are all the devices that we support now. So fair range of actually x86 CPUs and QEMU and then we have some, uh, a whole bunch of ARM platforms as well that we can test on. So what is the, the job definition? You guys probably can't read that at all. But it's broken down into three things. So our deploy, what images we want to deploy. And they, these image args, you probably can't read it. They're basically wrappers around those firmware tools. So it allows you, if you have to do something special with the firmware tool, add different flags, you can just define it there. And then that, that uh, bracket bootloader matches this name here. So basically, it's going to give you a place with that binary uh, when the call's made on the command line. So we have ability to flash multiple partitions with this schema, so we can put a bootloader down first that does a full chip erase, and then lay the application down. Um, and then the last step there is, okay, what does my start of the test look like? What's the end of it look like? And what's the regular expression to parse everything in between it? So that's kind of how the hardware testing looks. Uh, what's the rollout testing look like? So our CI builds are pushed into Hawkbit. Um, they're rolled out to one, well, it's one, one. Hawkbit's um, actually a deployment server, more or less, right, that does that manages devices. I think, who, who makes it? Is it? It's, a, it's part of the Eclipse. It's a part of the Eclipse Foundation, I believe, yeah. Um, and I know Bosch is using it. So we decided that, you know, it's, it's okay, it does its job, it's nothing, nothing fancy, but uh, yeah, it uses HTTP, we didn't have to worry about like other protocols like MQTT or uh, lightweight machine to machine. So a little bit easier to go, uh, but you can kind of see here, you know, on, on the left side here's our devices, on the middle column here is all the builds, and then on this side is all the activity, so you can kind of see when firmware updates fail, it rolls back to the image, it comes back online and, and ready to accept another image. So we can actually show you guys if there's time left over, I'm not sure where we are, where we are in time, but we can do um, a firmware rollout to like six devices in my house in Seattle from here remotely. I mean, we, that's basically, I think, kind of the progress we've made. Uh, our demo in uh, Las Vegas um, last year was like two devices on stage, and we got one to update. But now we're to a point where we can roll out to a lot of devices now and have pretty good confidence about uh, how, how things are going to work. So when that comes back up, we'll talk about developer testing. So <laughs> if it actually does, it's the anti there we go. So another kind of aspect of this is uh, when you're when you're developing something like this, you don't necessarily want to just do pull requests and not really know if it's going to pass the CI test because it can be embarrassing or it's just like I'd like to be more diligent than that. So we have a way that you basically say, here's my Git URL to my Zephyr tree. Here's the branch I want you to check out. And then um, that'll run sanity check. So like before our, our, our merges, when we go from RC1 to RC2, we push it into this thing and just see how the sanity check turns out. And if there's issues, we figure out, okay, well, do we need to patch that? So we always have a good 
uh, Zephyr branch that builds. Um, we can also do it with our photo application. Since our photo application depends on a Zephyr tree, we can say, here's, the, here's our photo app, here's our branch, could be you know, any developer's branch with their tree, and against any Zephyr branch um, and any Zephyr tree. So then it kind of puts together, we can take RC2, build our photo application with it, and then actually test it before we, we run any CI tests on it. So what are our future plans? We want to have developers be able to trigger hardware tests so they can you know, just kind of do that out of band, don't have to deal with the CI system, but there's an easy maybe command line way of, of triggering that. Um, automated rollouts for common pool of devices uh, distributed around the world. That's kind of my, my idea is that we get to a place where this is working good. We can really test you know, the Canary device as well, that all of the developers that are working on this project have a gateway you know, nine, nine, ten devices sitting at their desk, and a subset of those can just be automatically updated, you know, as new builds come out of the CI machine, and, and, and everything continues to work. So that's kind of like the goal for this, is to, to be able to have a centralized Hawkbit server pushing updates continuously to devices, because I think that's where you want to be for a product at some point, is to, to show that you can continually deliver software that's going to be stable and, and, and never really have much downtime. The other thing we're not solving right now that we've kind of neglected is that we're not delivering a bootloader over the air. So that's something that we want to do eventually. Uh, that's kind of the pain point right now is if we change something that's dependent on the bootloader, we have to go reflash all the devices, whether or not they're, they're in Hawkbit or not, because Hawkbit can't deliver the, the bootloader. So is there any questions about this? I know there's a lot of information. Um, and if there isn't, we can do some demos. That might be kind of fun. That's a manual process now. We, we kind of look and just say, oh, you know, the, the, the net changes were merged or the Bluetooth changes are merged. Okay, let's, let's pick it up and take a look at it. When there's interesting stuff, typically we don't like to go more than like two weeks because then the delta is massive and, you know, the quicker the better. But it, it does, you know, like we found this regression, so we know now we have to do some work to figure out, you know, what's going on. Go ahead. Yeah, one, one thing that we're not doing yet is, uh, and we're kind of why we're doing manually, is that most of the core changes are kind of um, we're getting them in like a big box of changes, like for example, the NAT branch related changes or the Bluetooth related changes. So we're just basically tracking mass right now. We're not, tr we still need to track like those individual branches because they change quite often and, and the merge when you have is like a huge merge actually. So we can kind of pinpoint and, and, and track what is going on in the master, but it's still kind of a little bit complicated to go back and, 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 and check because those merges are pretty big at, the, at this point. So this is something that we're not yet covering. OK, let's see how well our system works. So I guess we'll do a live demo, because I think that's fun. Um, so again, what do we have here? So we've got nine boards online right now. Three are nitrogens, six are carbons. We'll just update six carbons to keep it simple today. And so <laughs> we're going yeah, to roll out six updates right now to, to devices in the field. Um, so, and then these are our CI build numbers, so we'll just go to the bottom here and grab the latest. And so what's interesting is that the latest Zephyr build against for our platform is actually here, since we track all of that stuff, it's all being pushed into Hawkbit, so we have all these builds available. Eventually, we want to be able to just roll out Master Zephyr, our app built against Master Zephyr. I mean, that's the, the idea, is that we have zero deltas at all, it's all upstream, and we can just take that stuff, um, and it's very usable. So. Here's our 1.7 dev branch. Oh, that's lovely. I don't wonder why it's doing that. So I'm just going to drag them here. There's a rollout way. There's an API. You don't ever have to do this manually, but just for the sake of making it look cool. Okay, so let's just check and see what it's actually going to assign. Okay, so here's six different carbons. Same build. We're going to roll them out. Uh, before we do that, let's just take a look at the timestamps of when, they, when they've talked and what build number they're running, just so it's not vaporware. So, uh, 934. So that thing talked to Hawkbit. It's oh, annoying. You can see down here, uh, it talked to Hawkbit. Yeah, I will. I'm just going to show what build number's on here. Yeah, so we got build 171 on this device and all of the other ones, right? And we're going to update them to... 176. Just so we're gonna we're gonna go up a few versions. So we'll assign them, and now they go into the yellow state. Unfortunately, you can't really see the console logs and all. Actually, we can probably look at one as it's going here. Hold on. I 
I think that's a. We shall see. Let's see. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so it's this is the console output on one of the devices that we just asked to go and update. So it's looks like it's going to start downloading and flashing now. So all six are doing this. They're just cranking away, getting their update from the, the CI server. This is a UART on the on the carbon. Uh, that's a good question. How big is the, do you know how big the photo app is? Well, initially, when we were having problems with it after the, the demo in Las Vegas, you switched to just using pure Ethernet because it was like one less thing to deal with, yep. right? Eliminate all the other subsystems and just see if it would work just on native IP. Uh, one, like, just, just the Bluetooth stack plus the IP stack is around like 60, 70K or something. Like big, like big. Let's see if anyone's. Yeah, I mean, so all of this traffic's going over, you know, IPv6 over Bluetooth right now from a gateway. So we have an ARM64 gateway um, to ARM devices and talking to the cloud and it's being fetched and proxied through tiny proxy. So, I mean, it's exercising quite a lot of software to get an update. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it, it really is. I mean, it's like there's multiple players involved here. And, and um, I think this is kind of exciting because we're at the point now where I almost don't reflash my devices. I'd rather just roll an update out, and it's just that stable. So we want to keep it that way, and we also want to provide you know, this reference to, to the community. Like, if you guys want to do over-the-air updates for your product, we've got a good framework here. And, and you know, go ahead and use it and help us, help us build on this. I don't know. I mean, so we're kind of thinking about some, some longer-term issues here. Like, this thing's an app, right, that does updates. But that doesn't really make sense, right? If you, you want to develop your app that does some functionality, and then you just want to call a library to update, right? A, ser a service, exactly. There's like a daemon like DHCP, right? It just needs to be looking for it, and then it, when it decides there's an update, maybe it does a callback to the app saying, are you ready, save your state? And then you know it does. It says, "Yeah, I'm ready. Here's my ACK." And then it starts to pull the update and flash it and lock everything else out, right? So what just happened there was the my or our MCU boot validated that image because all of these are signed with our key. So if we sent an image down that was unsigned, it would have just reverted back to the other slot and came back up. So all of this outputs what we we process, right? So project execution successful. We blink the light. We can advertise the profile. All of that's using the, the uh, test case library in, inside of Zephyr. So you see we connected to Bluetooth again. So the app's going to delay a little bit and then start trying to talk to Hawkbit and say, hey, I'm all done with my update. So now it's talking to Hawkbit. Let's see if any of the other ones are done here. Oops. And we're complete. So you see here, we've got three that have updated. The other three are chugging along, probably doing something similar. They'll be along here shortly. There's also my there. Yeah. Which, which one is server and which one is client? So let me go back. This is all talking to the server, right? So these. So, the, so, so the server, the, the hawk, whatever, look, that's giving the device HTTP calls that, OK, here's, here's your stuff. Yeah, it's like a RESTful API, right? And so we're just. We call, we call every 30 seconds because the, the server actually tells you how long it wants you to, to pull, right? So we have it set at 30 seconds just to keep the devices active. We implemented like HTTP on the phone. Yeah, so we're, we're yep. part of the application. That's right. It's the, it's the HTTP server on the server. No, no. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's on a gateway. No, no. It's, it's being passed through the gateway. It's being passed through the gateway to the server. So we're actually, the devices are making HTTP calls to the server. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's being passed through the gateway to the server. So we're actually, the devices are making HTTP calls to the service directly. It's just being proxied mm -hmm. from IPv6 to IPv4 via the gateway and then to the okay. service. Okay. 
polling. Yeah, so like this this right here, it, it's sitting there and like, okay, do I have any more things to do? Do I have any more things to do? And then eventually when I drag those things and say assign them, the next poll, it's like, no, I want you to download this image. And I think if you actually go up a little bit here, you can see like this is the JSON response or part of it, right? It's like, go get these artifacts. Here's the MD5 for all of the, you know, the bits. Go pull them over HTTP. And then our app takes them and, and will chunk them and then write them in Flash kind of as it. Yeah, it's a, on, on a carbon, yeah. Are you, are you using the, for example, on, on the HTTP, are you using the Zephyr HTTP? No, the library, yes. The library, yes. Oh. Is that the, the one from the, the integrated yes. node project? Good. Ah, okay, so, okay, so everything, yeah, good. Yeah, the JSON. There's a JSON, the bottom the JSON, we're, we're not using that yet. Yeah, 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 the one yeah from obviously, the, the opportunity would be able to be able to get rid of our own connection. So that would make your application agile, and it's just a not one to do here. Is that a JSON parser? So we're five of the six devices, the other one, I mean, that's the other problem that we've got is that it seems like when we roll out a lot of devices, some devices connect to the gateway fast and download and someone, they go a little slower. So we still have to kind of look at those things, but we're able to, you know, roll out new software to a large set of devices. And really we, we're actually hitting, running up against gateway, like uh, Wi-Fi chip uh, kind of requirements that you, they can't have more than nine nodes endpoints connected over Bluetooth at a time. So to really scale this out, we just start, need to start adding more gateways and more devices. Actually, we have a similar demo. We, we, we used that in the hackathon, uh, which was yesterday, and uh, we had the same problem. And, uh, we used the Zephyr IPv6 on the PLE mm -hmm. to a gateway, and we were able to use like uh, six, seven, seven devices. That's what we're finding, too. You can kind of get more devices online, huh? We got to try that because. It's actually on the center side because the, 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 the Linux connects and, and then the center tells that, okay, with some callback that, okay, use these parameters and then they, they, the, the Linux will be used. Yeah. Yeah. This one that's from TI, you can say it's supporting like 10, but reliably we can only connect eight. Like if you're going to have yeah. nine or 10, yeah. it goes like one goes down, you got to go up. So. And, and you mentioned about the, the debug SS, uh, API, the yeah. yeah. uh, because I've been complaining the same thing. And, uh, we have been so they, they promised to fix it. Right. Yeah, so are they going to make an API through Blue Z to yeah. then call maybe a daemon that connect, yeah. like a real daemon that can yeah. do like a yeah. joiner daemon, right? That would be way better. Yeah, echoing stuff into debugfs is is fun, but you know, like not really a production thing. If anybody saw that code, and, you know. But one of the things that is nice is that now we're kind of able to focus on different problems. You know, like, like for example, the stacky API as well, like the application we can change to another protocol, like in TCP or something on the line, because we got something that's a knowledge worse. No, it can get back and check the API on the Linux side. And just to see, now the devices that have finished already are reporting the new version 176, so that's the software that's running. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to have more conversations around how we could you know, take this app, because the problem we're facing is now we want to put like a different protocol with a different device management service other than the Hawkbit in place. Now we do just have to fork our own app and make those changes, so we'd rather have something more modularized to you know, deal with the update 
side of things, and then you know the, your application can talk to device management backends. So you, you showed the Arduino 101 there. Yeah. Can we do the same with the, with the Arduino 101? Sure. You just, yeah, you'll have to flash drivers and partition layout, and yeah, should work. Yeah, should work trademark. So you can see the bootloader here. So yeah, one of the regressions that we had is that the clock ticks is more than order. Uh, and our previous driver that went in, because we're chain loading, now it kind of messes up like the clock. Oh, the, the, the most recent one? Yeah, the it's one. exactly. So that's something that we need to check. Like, you know. So how big is the, the set group? Well, then when you want to update it, you have to have another partition, yeah. scratch partition for that bootloader, and it, things get complicated. So, <laughs> All right, any other questions? I think we can kind of wrap this up. Thanks for getting up early, guys. I appreciate it.